Welcome and thank you for joining us for today's Facebook Live session on frequently asked questions on multiple myeloma diagnosis and prognosis. I'm Mary DeRome, Senior Director of Medical Communication and Education at the Multiple Myeloma Research Foundation. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Ken Shane and, uh, and Ms. Christine Simonelli from the H. Lee Moffitt Cancer Center in Tampa, Florida, and also Jackie Whitaker, a patient from Wesley Chapel, Florida. We've invited him here today to answer some of the frequently asked questions we receive from patients and caregivers when they've received a diagnosis for, of multiple myeloma. Last week, we hosted a webinar on this topic and we received many questions that we, more questions than we could possibly answer on the webinar. So we're going to take this time during the Facebook Live and hopefully get more of your questions answered. So let's first talk about myeloma diagnosis. Dr. Shane, patients and caregivers often want to know what their myeloma stage is. So can you explain what tests are conducted to determine a patient's stage and what the stage means, both for the care team and for the patient? Mary, thanks. And whoever asked that question, fantastic question. It's one of the things that we all want to know, right? What stage is my myeloma? And the way I review it with patients is I want to start by reminding them that myeloma has its own staging system. It's not one, two, three, four, like lung cancer or breast cancer, because Myeloma is already kind of everywhere, so we have to come up with our own staging system. And this involves multiple factors. It draw, involves some lab tests, it involves a bone marrow biopsy, and getting some genetic testing from that bone marrow biopsy. Um, and essentially what we want to do is we want to put you in categories. We have what we call the revised ISS, or National Staging System, which puts you into categories of one, two, or three. And that translates from kind of the best risk to a little lower risk or higher risk, meaning patients might not do as well as you want them to do, or patients will do optimally well. And so essentially we're looking forward to something called a beta-2 microglobulin, which is a blood test, literally called an albumin, which is a blood test, and an LDH, which is a blood test. And those things kind of tell us a little bit about what myeloma is doing, okay, the beta-2. Uh, <clears throat> the albumin tells you how well you're doing, and kind of the LDH shows how much inflammation is going on because of your myeloma. And then we pull out again, when we do a bone marrow biopsy, we're going to take some of the cells, your cancer cells, out of the bone marrow, which is where myeloma lives. We look for very specific genetic tests or molecular features that are associated with myeloma. And we know that we look for all these all the time. There's a string of them. And some we know are associated with better outcomes than others. Some are high risk. We always talk about deletion 17P, translocation 414. These are certain changes or losses of specific chromosomes that we know are associated with patients who have a little higher risk disease. And we put them all together in a scoring system called the Revised International Staging System. And if you have all good things, your RISS1. If you have bad things, meaning high-risk cytogenetics, which are those molecular characteristics, or a high LDH, and you have low lab tests, essentially that mean, means you're going to be RISS3. It just helps us guide how we want to think about taking care of you, right? We also want to make sure we give you an idea of how we think you're going to do. Um, you know, are you going to have a better outcome or not as good an outcome? But no matter how we look at it, your job is always to do better than whatever that risk says. And again, I always emphasize to patients is those categories are categories of patients. They aren't you. You are an individual. You will carry your own path. You'll have your own story along the way. So we use those as guides. And they also help us in some way kind of dictate what we're going to do with therapy, mostly long term, but also a bit short term as well. So that's kind of where I would suggest we think about staging. And it's a way for us, again, to categorize how we look at you relative to all the other patients with myeloma, okay? A good risk, middle risk, or kind of a higher risk. But again, you are your own patient. You have your own disease. Regardless of where you fit, we're going to walk you down a path that way. So hopefully that kind of puts it in a, in a general picture for you. I think so. And, you know, one thing I've always wondered is that clearly when patients are newly diagnosed and they present to their physician, then that's an important time to stage a patient. But are, stations, are, are patients staged at other times during their disease journey? Yeah, that's a fantastic question, Mary. And so what I always emphasize to patients is your stage, how we characterize you at the beginning is kind of how you walk to the rest of your disease. You will always be RISS1. You always have your paraproteins. And that kind of lives with you. Um, that being said, we have looked at staging and does it change over time? Yes. And does it work at different stages of disease? It does still put people in categories, but really we don't use that to define therapy as much afterwards. So really it's a, we need to have these tests done at the beginning. 
Right. And I emphasize this to say out loud, and patients, you guys can't figure this out, but a lot of times in the community, we have to make sure we get these tests because I can tell you more often than not, one of those things is missing. We can, it's kind of an incomplete staging, so we don't have the full picture of our patients, which again, I always emphasize making sure if you have a chance and it's available, try to get to a center that does see myeloma so you get all of those things done mm -hmm. and done appropriately so you can put you in the right category, mm -hmm. therefore give you the right therapy. Yeah, always important to see a myeloma specialist if possible, so mm -hmm. great advice. Um, okay, so Christine, can you tell us about what patients have to go through for tests, such as like a bone marrow biopsy or blood draws? For example, do patients need a port for frequent blood draws if they're a myeloma patient? Um, as Dr. Shane mentioned, um, patients undergo a bone marrow biopsy to confirm a new diagnosis. Uh, bone marrows at the center that I work at are typically completed under sedation, which often allows for a better sample to be obtained. Uh, in order for a patient to undergo a marrow under sedation, um, they have to have nothing to eat or drink after midnight the night before. Um, they have to um, have be holding all of their blood thinning medications for uh, two to three days prior to the procedure. And they're asked to bring a caregiver with them to assist with the drive home um, for safety as they've been under sedation. Um, once a patient is sedated, um, a needle is introduced in their um, posterior uh, iliac crest um, and a sample of the aspirate um, inside the marrow is drawn and a sample of the bone marrow biopsy is taken. Um, the procedure is relatively quick, about 20 minutes they're under sedation um, and the results of those marrows um, are typically back within one to two weeks. So in how addition, the, oh, sorry. Oh, no, uh, it's fine. In addition to the bone marrow biopsy, um, blood samples are also needed um, that Dr. Shane had mentioned, um, which are drawn from the peripheral vein. Uh, the blood tests include quantitative immunoglobulins, uh, looking for excessive heavy chains in the serum. Um, we do a serum protein electrophoresis with immunofixation, looking for a monoclonal M spike, um, as well as kappa lambda free light chains a beta-2 microglobulin, as well as a, a CBC and a complete metabolic panel. Um, we, ports are not recommended. We typically avoid them at all costs um, unless they're absolutely needed as they can add additional risks uh, to sure. patients for clots right. as well as infections. Mm -hmm. um, we also ask the patient to collect at their first visit a 24-hour urine collection to see if they have measurable myeloma uh, protein in their urine. Uh, once a diagnosis is confirmed, uh, the blood tests are completed uh, again at the beginning of each new cycle of therapy to con confirm that response to therapy uh, is being achieved. And we also um, perform imaging studies, which may include PET scans, total body MRIs, whole body CT scans, as well as bone marrow biopsies um, are also repeated at different time points uh, to assess for disease response. Um, often marrows are completed after induction um, and immediately prior to transplant, approximately three months post-transplant, um, and an additional time points um, afterwards to assess for MRD or minimal residual disease status. Okay, thank you. That was very comprehensive. Okay, so Jackie, I'm going to go to you now and ask you to walk us through when you were diagnosed with multiple myeloma and how did you learn that you had multiple myeloma? Um, what led you to go to the doctor or did you have a symptom or was it just, um, were you just at the doctor for a regular checkup and they found something, which I know happens to a lot of patients. How did it happen for you? Well, let me start off by saying thank you to the medical team and Mary for allowing me to participate today. Um, I couldn't be more excited to be here so others can learn about my, my uh, experience and my journey through this. Um, ironically, I learned about my myeloma through my dog. I was visiting my daughter in college in Georgia and a dog that never gets out of her harness decided to this day and run towards traffic. And she looked back at me to make sure I was following her, which I was uh, at high speed. And I grabbed her just before she hit a, a big intersection and I heard my back crunch, but I didn't feel any pain. So uh, my daughter and I drove 19 hours to Colorado to uh, have the holidays with my son. And uh, when I got there, um, a couple days after I arrived, I could no longer stand up straight. 
and went to the emergency room thinking I had broken a rib or two, by the way, I landed on my dog. And um, they came back, they did a, an MRI and a CAT scan and said that uh, I had a very complicated situation and um, something just told me it, it was much more serious than I had could ever expected. I had what they call a, a plasma cytoma and they thought it might be related to multiple myeloma, only they were not a cancer clinic but they wanted me to know um, this was serious. I had crushed three vertebrae oh um, in Georgia and drove 19 hours like that. So uh, I was very lucky to have caught it very early through my That's dog. Amazing story. Yeah. My goodness. Yeah. That darn dog, right? Oh, well, <laughs> maybe, maybe it's a good I'll thing. Right? Every day. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, you may have lived a lot longer with myeloma and it wouldn't have been caught so soon, right? You just never know. Yes, so. yes. Okay, so we're going to go back to you now, Ken. Uh, many patients ask about what it means to have certain genetic changes as part of the bone marrow biopsy testing. So we've all heard the terms um, chromosomal deletions, translocations, and amplifications. Can you help us understand what those changes are and, and what they might mean to a patient? Sure. So going back to kind of our initial question, right? What is part of staging, right? The revised ISS international staging. Part of that was those genetic changes, those cytogenetics or aberrations in, in the DNA. And essentially what we, we know is that to become, to go from a normal plasma cell, which is the normal cell variant that myeloma comes from, just like breast cancer, colon cancer comes from normal cells to become cancer, myeloma comes from a plasma cell is the normal cell. To do that, it has to acquire some genetic changes, some mutations in it. And we know that there are a handful or more than a handful of those that are kind of very typical for myeloma. And they involve kind of the either deletions, meaning losing part of a chromosome and the genes that are on it. Okay, so you can no longer, the, the cancer is changing between more aggressive than a normal cell. Or sometimes it involves the actual combination of two chromosomes at certain pot spots that drive the expression of certain genes that lead to, again, a more aggressive cell. And so those things together end up leading to myeloma. They cause myeloma itself. So all these genetic changes we see even in myeloma precursor conditions called MGUS or smoldering myeloma at differing very at varying rates, but essentially they're there beforehand because they're driving normal cell to become a cancer, i.e. myeloma. And what we've done is over time, we've learned in the myeloma world that certain ones we can identify equate with better or poorer prognosis. Okay, that goes again back to that high versus low risk. And so some of those, again, are deletions, and generally those are not good things because you're setting yourself up for lacking genes that help you do things, i.e. die. Okay, the cells die, not the patients. Uh, certain things are in deal with translocations that drive oncogenes, meaning genes that drive the cancer to grow. Again, those aren't always good either. And then certain cancer, the most common change actually in myeloma is lots of copies of odd number chromosomes, so the DNA carrying you know, parts of our, our nucleus. And they tend to be better off and not kind of fit in that good risk category. Mm -hmm. uh, but those long story short is these are things that we know that happen in myeloma, the genetic change that happens in myeloma that allows us to characterize what's going on in individual patients. And then based on those changes, you'll behave like X or Y. Um, so far, they've only been prognostic. So what does that mean? Prognostic means they help us put you into categories of Again, you're going to do better or you're not going to do as well as we want. But more recently, we've learned that even certain drugs may be targeted to certain genetic changes. Okay, so I think it'll be very, very exciting in the context of myeloma. Um, one of those, just as an example, is the translocation, putting together of two chromosomes, of chromosome 11 and 14, okay, called translocation 11 and 14. We're not very inventive in the world of myeloma, that's just what it is. But we know patients who carry that gene are really sensitive to a very specific drug called venetoclax. And so we're learning more and more and testing this in clinical trials. This is a new drug we can utilize in myeloma. Now, it's not FDA approved for myeloma yet, but again, it's a drug we use frequently in this disease. It's approved for other diseases. But we've learned that that genetic change is a really important biomarker, a predictive biomarker, meaning if you have that, you're likely really sensitive to that drug. So you have another, you know, another, another therapeutic in your armamentarium against your disease. So mostly they're used for us to decide how we, the risk of your disease but as you learn more and more about the genetics, those specifically the more detailed genetics, maybe a better tailored therapy to what drugs you should be getting and when. And those are all things that we're all working on research at Moffitt and around the world to try to figure out how we can better allocate all these cool therapies mm -hmm. to the right patients at the right time. Yeah, yeah. So 
we, we have that to look forward to in the future as we gather in more and more data, right? So that'll be great. So um, Christine, what information is important for patients and their caregivers to keep track of once the patient has been diagnosed and the diagnosis has been confirmed? Um, so once a diagnosis is confirmed, a patient should be aware of the type of multiple myeloma that they have so that they can watch those uh, markers with each cycle of therapy. Um, an example would be Ms. Whitaker. Um, she has IgG kappa multiple myeloma. And so monthly, she's checking that her IgG level, um, her kappa light chains, and her serum M spike and urine M spikes were trending downward. Um, as opposed to going upward. Um, along with tracking these disease markers, a patient and their caregivers, um, we always wanna make sure that they know the drugs that they're currently taking, um, the most common side effects that may occur with each of the drugs, and certainly um, the telephone number to their team so that if they run into any problems, um, they can reach out immediately. Um, I also tell my patients um, to track their cycles in a calendar um, as well as appointments and share times so that they are less likely to miss any of their appointments. Um, I also, I think it's a good idea. So in case a patient would um, be admitted to a local hospital, they're able to um, tell the admitting physician that they have multiple myeloma, what the drugs are and where they are in that particular cycle of therapy. That makes sense to have all that stuff at your fingertips if you ever need it. So Jackie, I mean, myeloma is such a complicated disease and there really is a lot to it. Um, there's a lot to learn. And so can you tell us a little bit about how, like how you learned about multiple myeloma so that you could understand, you know, the, the results of your lab tests and what they meant and other aspects of your, of your care and your disease? It is a very complicated subject, especially from somebody not in the medical field. Um, I research everything, that's part of who I am. And um, I, I've been blessed to have a brother who's also a physician who guided me to Moffitt for their care as mm -hmm. a best, the best fit for me. Mm -hmm. Also researched my medical team and thought I was in good hands with the route that we, we decided to go with Dr. Shane and uh, Christine's group. Um, I, I will tell you this, over the years, you see doctors, you know, and you can compare how their bedside manners are and how well they explain things. When you're given a diagnosis, a diagnosis of cancer, everything goes through your mind, right? It's the end of the world. You know, it's the dark side of the moon. You think the worst. And, and I did. I was broken from the inside and out. I had crushed vertebrae. I'm dealing with cancer. You know, I was 52 at the time, 53. And... Uh, just didn't didn't know what to expect the first time i sat down with my medical team dr shane took the time as much time as i needed to answer my questions i always go in with a list of questions they probably hate to see me coming <laughs> but it takes this time that's good though that's really good you gotta get the questions answered you know it's important really as a patient to write this down because it yes. can become very overwhelming you forget it the minute you walk out the door say oh my gosh what did he just say mm -hmm. um, i keep a calendar which christine was was wonderful about suggesting i keep um this has every appointment in here it has all of my my markers so it, it triggers me to write my questions the night before i go in and i have a better understanding coming out of what to expect and and what the plan is going forward mm -hmm. So that is like, that's a really great piece of advice, right? And, you know, it's, it's really something I think to um, be encouraged is for patients to really be involved with their own care, just because this is such a complicated disease. Um, it really is important for, um, for patients to really keep track of what's happening, you know, absolutely. their doctors, you know, teach them, et cetera. Yeah, absolutely. So, so uh, uh, Dr. Shane, a lot of patients at every webinar and at every patient summit, patients always ask, is there a hereditary component to multiple myeloma or the precursors conditions of myeloma? So is it, if you have a member of your family who's been diagnosed with a precursor or with multiple myeloma, is it important for everybody in the family to get tested? So Mary, what I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop for one second, I'll come to the question in a second. But I wanna emphasize what both Christine and, and Jackie said is that as a patient, you know, you wanna take ownership of your disease as much as you can. Everybody's gonna have their own amount, right? 
Like Jackie, trust me, she brings in 50 questions. And my goal is to answer as many as I can before she actually asks them. That's kind of my game. I'll see what happens. But other people don't. But again, you want to be invested in your care because that's how you get the best care you can. And again, Christine's points about knowing what's going on, at least having a list so you can hand it to people is your safety, your health, how we take care of you long term. Because again, this isn't a sprint. This is a marathon. That's the biggest thing I think I've tried to emphasize. Everybody I see is that this is years and years and years as long as we can make it. You, know, so you want to be in, involved as much as you can. But again, everybody has their own amount. There's no right or wrong. We're here to take care of you either way. I just want to kind of emphasize those points because I think what Christine mentioned and what Jackie mentioned is real, are really critical for the best care you yeah. can get. Agree. Agree. <clears throat> All right. So back to your question, which is about kind of genetic predisposition and or screening. And so the way I kind of try to address it with most patients is, you know, it's very rare okay but not unheard of to have a pass down from generation to generation meaning there are patients who have brothers fathers uncles aunts that have myeloma and there's obviously some genetic component we don't know what that genetic component is but it's still a rare phenomenon myeloma is generally a disease that is is comes on with age so any it's spontaneous it just happens because of how yeah. our immune system tries to function and you get these mutations we talked about earlier leading to myeloma okay. now that doesn't mean there isn't some increased risk for first three relatives, there are certain groups in this world that have a higher risk than the normal person for developing myeloma or MGUS, it's pre precursor condition, okay? Um, and so there's about a two-fold increased risk of people with myeloma in their first three relatives. So mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, sons, and daughters for developing this, okay? So what I ask them today is please make sure you tell them, inform them, and let them make the decision, but make it as part of their family history so that their physician may go look for myeloma sooner rather than later if there's something a little odd going on. That's standard of care. Now, that being said, we're in a world today where we have really good drugs. We have really good ways of testing for myeloma. We're changing outcomes to a better place every single year we we're here. So we need to start in, you know, kind of embracing ways to find myeloma sooner. And again, we know everybody has myeloma has a precursor condition called MGUS for years, if not decades beforehand. And so although there is no screening today at your primary care physician for these antibodies, these proteins we can measure in your blood, there's a huge kind of endeavor called the PROMISE study. I'm plugging this a little bit. Oh, yeah. The MRF is part of, okay, mm -hmm. we're part of Dana-Farber, I mean, Gobriel, and a number of other individuals across the country are participating in what we're trying to screen 30,000 people, okay, with higher risk for having MGUS. And those are people that are first few relatives of patients with myeloma, okay? Again, mom, dad, brother, sister, sons, and daughters. Or if you're African-Americans, you actually even have a higher risk of having MGUS or myeloma by incidence. So those two groups of high risk, we're trying to screen those, and it's all online. But the goal of that is can we get enough people to be screened to figure out who has it? And can, by screening, can we identify patients who are higher risk for developing myeloma? For the dealers, we can better treat our patients ahead of time. So can we get people in clinics faster, have better outcomes? We have to learn and test, is that a good thing to do? But right now, there's no active screening for myeloma as a standard of care. Mm -hmm. But it's something we all recommend, we start mm -hmm. thinking more about, and we're testing that out right now. So I think the answer is we need to test for it, but we haven't proven how important it is yet. So, so that's great. I'm glad you brought up the PROMISE study. That's something that patients often ask about how to get screened. And actually, you can get screened for free if you are in those categories that uh, Dr. Shane mentioned, first degree relatives or African American. Um, and uh, you can just look up the PROMISE study online. It's at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston. So you'll be able to just Google it, you'll be able to find it and you can just join directly online. And they'll send you a blood test. You go and have your blood drawn, you send it in and they will screen it. Yep. So, and they're happy and then, to and then they send you to the Milo Center that you're local to. They don't send you to, you have to drive to Mass. You come to Mass, right, exactly, exactly. you go to whatever, whatever. So it's a yeah. way to make it as easy yeah. for you yeah. uh, to get it taken care of. Yeah. Okay. So what is next here? Okay. So we're going to talk to Christine a little bit about uh, precursor conditions. So if a patient is found to have smoldering multiple myeloma rather than multiple myeloma, is seeing um, a myeloma specialist still important from your perspective, Christine? Um, absolutely. Any patient with um, MGUS, smoldering myeloma, or multiple myeloma should absolutely be seen by a multiple myeloma specialist for a second opinion and to confirm the diagnosis. Uh, once the diagnosis of smoldering myeloma um, is uh, confirmed, uh, those patients should typically be followed every three months 
with multiple myeloma labs to watch for any crab criteria or um, progression to active disease. Um, typically, uh, smoldering myeloma patients, are, the standard of care is, is for observation. Um, however, um, by seeing a myeloma specialist, a patient may have access to clinical trials earlier for a patient, you know, that has smoldering myeloma. Right, right. So that's really great advice. And I, I want to sort of reinforce that one of the reasons why it's so important to see a specialist um, if you've been either diagnosed with myeloma or a precursor of myeloma is because myeloma just is not that prevalent a disease. It's only 1.8% of all cancers. And chances are, if you're just seeing your regular community physician, maybe they see one or two myeloma patients a year. So they would not be sort of aware of all the newest treatments, all the newest therapies, all the newest tests that, um, that a specialist would be aware of. So that's one of the, another reason why it's really, really important to see a specialist, you know, no matter where you are in your disease. Can I jump in for a second, Mary, too, just to add something? Also, when you have, if you're identified with MGUS or smolder myeloma, there's also chances increased. There's, there are clinical significant issues associated with it. So it's important for you to get, again, and, you know, seeing myeloma specialists, you can make sure that they're, it's actually not involving other organs that may be more subtle. So again, that's why it's, it's really important, not just to be followed, but also to make sure that this is all you have going on and you are treated or not treated for the right reasons and those mm -hmm. kind of things. So I just want to kind of add that point to do yeah. not just yes or no. Yes. Great. Okay. So we're going to move a little bit uh, on into uh, treatment here. So we're going to talk about initial treatment for patients. Christine, I'm going to start with you. How long is a typical course of therapy for a newly diagnosed patient? Um, so a typical course of therapy um, or a, a cycle, I want to start with a cycle. A typical course, uh, excuse me, a cycle of therapy is usually 28 days long. Um, often included in that 28 day cycle is a week off of therapy. Um, induction courses um, differ from patient to patient. Um, an example would be if a patient is a transplant eligible patient, the induction course is usually four to six cycles or four to six months of therapy prior to the transplant. Uh, patients that are not eligible for transplant will have a longer course of therapy, um, maybe approximately nine to 12 months um, or cycles um, before transitioning to a maintenance regimen. Perfect. So um, Dr. Shane, in our webinar last week on newly diagnosed multiple myeloma, some of our speakers summarized regimens highlighted by the National Comprehensive Cancer Network as either preferred regimens or recommended res uh, recommended regimens for, um, in, for patients in certain circumstances. So can you explain the differences between those categories of treatment for newly diagnosed patients? Sure. So the NCCN is a group of individuals where we sit around a table or Zoom these days and we review, you know, what is the best data, where are these studies, what has been looked at. And essentially you kind of have a grading system from one to A to B three. And essentially if we have lots of good clinical data suggesting this regimen is better than whatever the state of care was and everybody agrees, then that would be a kind of a one. And that'd be kind of your preferred regimens. Then you kind of go down to a 2A, which means that there's really good data and there's good consensus, meaning most of us all agree this is a really good therapy. Uh, again, next thing. And then down a little further, there's consensus. We all agree, but the data might be not quite as strong. And then three means there's a little bit of controversy on how much we want to think about that regimen. And again, using certain dis drug or drug combinations in a certain group of patients means things that we can tell us a high risk or not. When you think about preferred, it really means that these are drug combinations that work really well and they have really good data behind them and recommended essentially this, a similar concept, just a little less, but again, still recommended, still highly effective, just maybe a little less data. So that's kind of how I think about it. Um, now, that doesn't mean we all use exactly that when we make decisions about therapy because we all are pushing the envelope of what's right for myeloma. Mm -hmm. We're using therapies that are our standard of care and our individual preferred or, or Institution preferred regimens might be a little ahead of that, might not have quite all the data yet, but we know how good they are. We want to push those going forward. So that's kind of how I think about the NCCN and how we think about those guidelines. But really anything on the top is really well documented. You know, we all in agreement this is a really great regimen for our patients, meaning safe, effective kind of combination. Mm -hmm. And and some of those, you know, safe and preferred regimens are sort of um, whether or not a patient gets them does um, play into the 
the decision of whether or not they happen to be a high risk patient or a not high risk patient, right? Absolutely. I mean, the patient in front of you is going to decide, dictate a lot of what you're going to get. And again, we all have guides that kind of help us decide who those patients are. But no matter who you are, the drugs you get as an induction, starting therapy, or even later in relapse, the same story happens. Is based on who you are, what your disease state looks like at that time, whether it be risk, how you are, your strength, okay, what else is going on at the same time. So, you know, I think, thankfully, we have a number of these regimens, and so we're allowed to, one, tell the regimens and also the doses within the regimens to fit the patient sitting across from us, because that's the most important thing is getting patients on the right drugs, but also the right doses so they can stay on therapy. You know, right. putting you on drugs, but being too toxic is not something you want to do. Yeah. You want to look at that patient, get them on therapy, because that's how you control disease. And that's our yeah. goal. Yeah. Our goal is long-term control of disease. Okay, great. Okay, Jackie, we're going to go to you and ask about your initial treatment. So which initial treatment did you receive? And did you learn of any specific reasons why that particular regimen was chosen for your first like line of therapy? Well, going back to how individualized myeloma is, each patient, that's really tough. And that's where you really have to have an open communication with your medical team. Dr. Shane always gives me options. It's not just black and white. And he'll tell me what to expect from this option versus this option. And then I, I could, you know, decide for myself, which was a better fit for me with his guidance. Um, so as as reluctant as i was to jump into therapies i knew i had to do something um and i'm not a medication type person so it was very hard for me to to wrap my head around oh my gosh here we go but i gotta say and i, I don't mean to keep tooting your heart dr shane you put, me, you put me at ease really seriously because i i was afraid you know i'm I'm dealing with the cancer and all this other stuff i had my bro my back was still broken um, and I was healing from that. And, and he really gave me some options that made me feel more, more comfortable taking. And that was the path we took initially. So I believe it was a seven cycle series. Um, we didn't quite get my numbers down to exactly where he was hoping. So I had almost a partial response, but not quite there yet. Um, so we went into another cycle of a different therapy, which, which actually got me there. So, mm -hmm. you know, it was with, with the help of my medical team that, that helped me decide which would be the best route for me to go based on my numbers. Yeah. You guys sound like you're a textbook case of, you know, the perfect communication between the care team and the patient, right? And keeping these lines of communication open and making sure that everyone is aware of the goals of the patient for therapy and the goals of the care team for therapy and discussing this and just making decisions together is, is really, really important, not just for outcomes, but also for a patient's, you know, peace of mind. And if everybody's understanding that it's all moving in the right direction. So, yep. And I also add that Christine probably does most of the communicating because she keeps us all online. <laughs> okay. that's, that's the nurse's role. Okay. That's the role. <laughs> all right. So, Christine, um, at what point do you discuss with a patient the option of undergoing a stem cell transplant? Yeah. So, generally speaking, um, if a patient is felt um, to be a candidate for transplant, it's brought up briefly at the first visit. Dr. Shane, um, wants to give our patients an idea of what the standard of care is after induction therapy, which um, includes transplant followed by maintenance. Um, at each visit, um, we give our patients a little more education um, on the transplant. I often give them up front the first time I meet them a brochure on what stem cell transplant entails so that they can read up on it. Um, and e at each visit, we delve a little bit deeper into those transplant discussions. Um, and this way, once they we place a consult for them to meet the transplant team, they have a better understanding and their, their questions um, are certainly um, more in depth for the transplant team to answer and they, they have a, a better understanding. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, sometimes, um, you know, it takes them a while to get there, but I think it's important to, um, you know, certainly give that information up front to patients. Yeah, that makes sense. So, and then, um, so often, well, there are times that, that patients will collect stem cells and then maybe elect not to have a transplant until later. 
But um, so do you, if patients make that decision, um, is it important to advise patients to freeze their stem cells when they're, when they can, just so even if they don't want to have the transplant right now, they could have it in the future, if that might be a possibility. Yeah, so with regards to collecting and storing, um, the, the patients always meet our, our transplant team to have those discussions. We certainly recommend that all transplant eligible patients um, do indeed collect and store their cells. Um, the big problem um, that is often um, found is that insurance coverage may not be there. Um, for Some insurance plans um, do not allow for collect and store up front, um, making it an option that's not available to the patients. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that becomes a difficult discussion, yeah, which yeah, yeah. Um, is certainly a discussion that happens with the transplant team. Mm -hmm. oh, that's interesting. I did not know that. Okay. Mm -hmm. You guys are just so informative. We so, try. Okay. <laughs> um, and for anybody who wants to hear more about transplant, we're actually going to be doing another webinar um, in a few weeks and then another Facebook Live after that, which will actually delve quite deeply into a stem cell transplant. So we will have a lot more information on that, not in this webinar, but in, in subsequent webinars and Facebook Lives. So you can stay tuned for that. Okay, so Dr. Shane, some patients note that their care teams focus on the M spike value as a measure to determine whether or not the patient has responded to the treatment they've been given. So um, is, is the reduction in M spike value um, levels, how response is measured and how low do those levels have to go? So that's a really great question. So for the next 45 minutes, I'm going to give you the IMWG clinical response <laughs> criteria. Okay, listen, I know I said year. that there was no time limit on this, oh, but we can't <laughs> So Christine has mentioned, I've mentioned, and Mary's mentioned that we're following these abnormal protein levels, these M spikes in your serum. Okay, so myeloma proteins, bad proteins, whatever you want to call them, through an M spike, through your IgG, through your IgA, or through your IgG, or maybe M even less, less commonly as well as your serum free light chains. And then we should be measuring them though less and less these days, even in a urine protein electrophoresis. Okay, so urine M spike. But that's not fun and not many people want to bring those in. Ask Jackie, she can tell you how often she brings them in. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Uh, but anyway, so the point is, yeah, we're tracking those numbers because that number when you're diagnosed equals the number of bad guys you have in your marrow, okay? So as you kill bad guys in your marrow, those numbers get lower and lower and closer to closer to normal. And for an M spike, that's zero. For you know, serum for that means your ratio is normalized, and that's what we can test above the ground, so to speak. We can test those every month, every cycle you come in. We check those numbers, we watch them go down. And we have really inventive phrases like partial response, meaning 50% decrease in those numbers. A very good partial response, meaning 90%. Then we have complete response, stringent complete response. All those things mean is we can't measure those proteins anymore. And then once you get to that CR or complete response state. We have to do another bone marrow biopsy and imaging to make sure there's nothing we can see in either of those places. Okay. And now today, so the best response we could have gotten five years ago was a stringent, complete response. No proteins are abnormal. Your marrow doesn't, you don't see any bad guys and your PET scan's negative. Today, we can actually test even deeper than that. We can check under the water, so to speak. And we can check as few as less than one in one million cells in your bone marrow. We call that minimal residual disease testing. And we do it mostly by next generation sequencing. Though there's a lot of multi-parameter flow cytometry or high definition flow cytometry ways of measuring it as well. And that's what we can measure even deeper than we ever have before. And essentially what we're doing there is we're just kind of assessing how well our drugs have worked, okay, for individual patients. And generally the deeper you are, generally, not for everybody, translates to better outcomes, which is why we want to know all these things so much. So those are the things that I would suggest are ways we assess response. And so what we all want is we want to be CR, final CR, and MRD negative. That's great. Not everybody gets there. It's still not the majority of patients. So it's not the end all be all, but it helps us put a goal in there to help think about how we want to think about giving you therapy, adding drugs to maybe get you a little further. And again, the importance of sequencing therapy. And we hope one day that kind of assessment will help us make decisions about whether you need transplant or don't. Maybe when we can stop maintenance therapy because maintenance therapy goes on forever in the states okay so someday we can learn about these things but today we're just using them to tell you how awesome you did with the response to therapy but hopefully it'll translate into something we can do in terms of operationally yep let's get you off therapy or no we really need to do this or don't need to do that those are things we're all working on in clinical trials 
to help figure that out. Again, why clinical trials are so important. Every step in myeloma, not just newly diagnosed, not just late relapse, but every step of myeloma needs to help figure out how we can better take care of you guys, both short-term, long-term, and the next generation of myeloma patients as well. Yeah, that's great. So Jackie, let's go to you and, and hear about your experience. Um, what was your response to treatment? I think that you mentioned it a little bit in one of the previous questions that you needed to have a, one extra um, round of therapy to get to your your um, your partial response or very good partial response. Um, did you opt to have a stem cell transplant and did you have MRD testing as well? I was given the option to have the stem cell transplant. I held off a little longer. I was kind of one of the lucky ones that was diagnosed very early. Um, so I hadn't, I did not have to go through a lot of failed um, therapies to get to where I was. So being the chicken that I am, I, I held off on the stem cell transplant when I was lucky enough to get a seat that one of the last seats on the CAR T cell transplant. And mm -hmm. it was the best decision I ever made with the team. It, it really was the best thing I ever did. And I've never felt better as a result of it. Um, here today to tell you I'm in complete response right now. So um, I think there was a reason I held off on the stem cell because CAR T was gone. <laughs> I just didn't know it, but it, it was it was really a wonderful decision that I made for myself. Um, M, the uh, the uh, MRD testing, yes, they tested. The first time I uh, finally tested negative, which, which was just a, a few months after my transplant. And I have remained um, negative ever since. So, yep. So yeah. I think you're, you're you may be the the like the earliest patient that I that I've spoken to that's had a CAR T like really literally after your first line of therapy. That's pretty amazing. It was second line, but yes, it is amazing. Yeah. Truly amazing. Yeah. Yep. She did great, but she was a great example of someone when you again you have to personalize therapy a little bit, right? A transplant is a real decision people need to make, and although I'll tell you and I'll tell everybody that. The best way to take care of myeloma today is still induction, transplant, maintenance therapy. Transplant is not for everybody, right? Whether they be organ problems, they can't get it, or sometimes it just, you know, where you are in life, you can't sacrifice that amount of time, or where you are in life, you just can't mentally wrap your head around that amount of toxicity and what it really means. Mm -hmm. You know, you have that right to collect and store, as you said. And, and Jackie, you know, we, you know, Christine, we all talked about it. So this is what in our transplant group, we said, you know, this is what we, here's what I want you to do. But here's a path that's not really for you. And she said, let's wait a little bit. We got a response really nice. And then again, CAR T rolled around just at the right time for her. The study opened up. And I was like, I have the perfect person for you because she doesn't like seeing me at all. She doesn't want to come in every month, no matter what. <laughs> I can get in three months after she gets control, she'll be happy. And so she 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 underwent CAR T. And yeah, she's been student CR MRD negative since. Let's keep it that way, madam. Yes. And no therapy, just watching her. She just comes and gets labs every three months, may or not bring a 24 hour urine. Perfect. Amazing. Amazing. So speaking of, you know, survival, right? So so Dr. Shane, let's talk a little bit about the statistics on survival and multiple myeloma. So what percentage of people who are diagnosed with myeloma um, live beyond five years or live beyond 10 years or even 20 years, right? I know that these statistics, you can you can find them in many different places and sometimes they're old and sometimes they're fresh statistics. So it's a little bit hard to tell, you know, what the actual survival is right now. Yeah, so I'm gonna answer that probably in several different ways. First, I hate statistics. Okay? I think, <laughs> Mary, you said it really well. Where you get the statistics tells you a lot about when the statistics were done. Mm -hmm. Right. So I have patients coming in and find, oh, I'm going to live five years. That's all I'm going to live because they use statistics from a long time ago. Right. That's not the expectation today. Um, and even those modern statistics we have in myeloma probably aren't all that realistic because they're from five years ago because it took us this long to figure out what's going on. And thankfully, in myeloma today, every half decade, we're making huge, I'm not saying little tiny incremental, but huge strides in how we take care of patients. Right. I mean, so look at Jackie. She had CAR T as second line therapy. Amazing. Right. Okay? Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's going to change. Anybody gets that? CAR T is going to change how we think about it. By specifics as they come around, they're going to change. Oh, wait a minute. Daratumumab. All these new therapies we have, and every five years this happens. You can plug in drug X, Y, or Z or combination. We keep pushing that. And kind of an example I kind of use is if you look at for transplant eligible patients, right? You know, the folks at Emory put together this thousand patients, you know, team of their stuff. And these patients, with transplant and risk adapted therapy, again, going back to what you want to look like and how you drudge therapy that way, 
you know, the expectation should be on average 10 years, right? That's a, amazing. That's, that's my expectation. When I see somebody, mm-hmm. that's average. So some people less, some people yeah. more. Yeah. And then your risk, again, divides you into different categories too. Better if you're standard, a little less if you're high. But again, long story short is you are your own myeloma. You're different than anybody else. And that path is going to be different for you than it is than that statistic. And so I think although they're great for kind of guidelines, they're terrible for making people feel good about themselves. Yeah. Because when you have myeloma today, hope is the answer. Yeah. You know, reality is you have it, but we have lots of hope. And so yeah. That's the we get to other things later on. But I don't like statistics from that perspective. Yeah. Uh, myeloma patients want to go find statistics. Like I have trials I go look at and I can compare them all and see how these patients do. Um, but, you know, go to places that are reputable. There's this place called the MMRF. It's pretty good. It has really good data on their website. You know, there's other places at LS. You know, to, there's all kinds of legitimate places to get information about myeloma. Mm-hmm. Um, they're as up to date as you can. But again, yeah. always bring a salt and always understand what's going on. And you have your own path. So yeah. it's just kind of a guideline. So I, I, yeah. long story short is I don't like statistics. Mm-hmm. I, mean, I like them, but I don't like them for survival because it's a very, yeah. a very difficult target. And when you're diagnosed today. Right. It really doesn't apply what happened five years right, ago. Right, 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 right. And like you said, it's so individualized, right? And, you know, people use these statistics, you know, it's really a, a, almost a part of clinical studies, right? When they're trying to figure out which which regimen works better for a group mm-hmm. of patients, right? And that's when they really become much more important. And that's why they measure them. But exactly. um, so what about patients who have other medical conditions besides myeloma, like some, that we would call like the comorbidities, right? Maybe they have diabetes or they have heart disease or something. So so how are those patients treated because of their, their underlying other diseases? Um, besides myeloma? And does that sometimes affect the outcome from their myeloma? So a couple things, if you're addressing that to me, I'll take it, I guess, yeah. is, um, you know, the comorbidities is probably one of the most important things you have to balance with mm-hmm. the therapies we have. So most therapies can be relatively agnostic, meaning they can be treated through most other medications you might be on for any other issue. But one of the things we treat a lot of patients with, I'd say everybody with, is it's called dexamethasone. We love steroids because they kill bad guys really well. Um, but they're not the most friendly people who have diabetes, okay, or have other issues of weakness and things like that. So they cause your sugars to go up, even though they're killing bad guys. So we have to tailor our therapies to those kind of things, right? If you have diabetes, we have to have help from your endocrinologist or your primary care physician to make sure you're on top of your sugar, right? Or if we drive your sugars up and we make you induce a kind of a diabetic state, we need some help there as well. Heart issues, you know, we think about certain drugs, maybe a little safer than other drugs when it comes to having cardiovascular risk. But even those patients have cardiovascular risk, there are drugs we're going to use regardless of that risk. We just need to temporize that, you know, have a conversation. Here's the risks, here's the benefits, our eyes are open, we need this now. Mm -hmm. Um, But we're always going to maximize and ask patients to make sure they stay on top of these things. Because the healthier you are from a other perspective, comorbidities, meaning other things you have, the better off you're going to be. Um, you know, COPD is another thing we have to be a little careful with. So, can, you know, pulmonary issues. These are all things we have to balance with the therapies we're doing. But again, picking the right drugs, the right doses of drugs is probably as important and the right supportive care medications. But it takes a team. It's a village. You know, you know, Jackie, although she doesn't have a lot of other comorbidities, she came in with back issues, we need neurosurgery, we need, you know, they need a lot of XRT, we need radiation or yeah. something. So it's a team no matter how you look at it. If it's yeah. all myeloma mm-hmm. or if it's myeloma plus the other things you brought before you had myeloma. So that's kind of my answer to it. It takes, it takes a team to do it. it. It's a lot of work and I apologize to patients who have it, but it is a lot of work to kind of keep up on all these things. <laughs> the last thing I'll say is I'm too dumb to mecha- recognize all those things too. So I need help with taking care of diabetes. <laughs> And blood pressure at certain levels. So, we well, know. you know, when you're a specialist, you got to specialize, right? Yeah. So you know what you know, right? So, yeah. Okay. Uh, so, speaking of bones, um, Christine, we've got, we had a number of patients at the webinar talk about the effect that myeloma has on bone. And, Jackie, you're a great example of this. And this is, that's how many patients are diagnosed, actually, is some kind of bone breaking. Often it's something having to do with back. So, individuals have compression factors in your back, which is what you had, Jackie or they have lost some inches in their height, they have difficulty breathing, it's difficult to take a deep breath. And so, so Christine, how can you help patients who sort of have these problems due to um, like compression factors or, or vertebrae problems in their bones? Yeah, so um, when patients have compression fractures, pain is often associated with them. And we certainly do our best um, to keep patients pain controlled. 
Um, sometimes that's with narcotic usage, sometimes um, radiation therapy. Um, we also refer to our neurosurgeons to assess if kyphoplasty may be an option for them for support and pain reduction. Uh, kyphoplasty can often decrease the pain uh, the patient is experiencing, as well as de decrease the risk of additional um, fractures from occurring. Uh, we also um, typically recommend um, calcium and vitamin D supplementation and bisphosphonates um, with Exgiva or Zometa to help prevent any new fractures and worsening of the bone symptoms. So, um, so Dr. Shane, we did have a couple of patients ask in the last webinar, if they have problems with their bone or problems with their back, do you ever recommend patients to go see a, a chiropractor? Is that helpful? <laughs> All right, so statistics. A loaded question. Chiropractors are even worse than, they're higher on the list than statistics. Um, so, you know, no, no offense to any chiropractors who are listening because you all are wonderful people. Um, but it's important that you, you know, we don't like chiropractors too much because when they manipulate things, they can break things and our bones aren't always as strong as we want them to be. Again, most chiropractors are going to be good. They're going to make sure they get imaging first. They might find myeloma for that matter. Yeah, right. right. Because uh, myeloma with back pain, myeloma is not the first thing anybody thinks of. Is thinks of I just bent over and hurt something. Ask Jackie; she'll tell you. Right? She didn't think she had myeloma. I guarantee it. She probably never heard of myeloma before. Um, so it's important that we think about that. But chiropractors, yeah, not not our favorite folks to be helping with pain unless we know that it's going to be massage and more, you know, subtle interventions that they can do. And I have lots of patients who insist that's all they do, and then I insist back. Just make sure they don't manipulate you because we don't need more broken bones, please. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, chiropractors, again, great people. I have friends who are chiropractors, but they're not folks I want messing with my myeloma patients. Yeah, I can kind of see that. So so what about osteonecrosis of the jaw, which is another thing sometimes that happens um, with myeloma treatment? Mm -hmm. um, so can you talk a little bit about what causes that and, and how patients are evaluated for it? Um, so, and, and whether patients can get that taken care of by like an, uh, their dentist or an oral surgeon, like what, what are the things that they need to watch out for? Sure. So Christine mentioned that whenever we talk about bone health, right, that's part of myeloma. There's killing myeloma cells. That's what we're really good at. And we need to provide a lot of supportive care. And supportive care involves protecting you from the drugs we're giving you, but also protecting your bones. And that involves can be Zometa as a, you know, the bisphosphonate or Exgiva as another agent that can, again, build up the bones that are left, reduce fractures in the future. Calcium, vitamin D, we like to do it again, make sure you have all the building blocks for that. But one of the risks that both Zometa and Exgiva or drugs in their class have is for reasons that are never clear to me because they're there to build bones, but they always, they can make what's called an unhealing ulcer in your jaw, the mandible, essentially because of the environment, the nat, you know, the fun environment of your gum and your mouth is that you can get an ulcer and it impedes the formation of healing of that bone right there. And that's called osteonecrosis of the jaw. And there are certain things that give risk factor, poor, poor dentition, extractions. Those are things that really can drive an increased risk for getting osteoporosis of the jaw. So generally, what you do is have people get a dentist appointment, make sure their teeth are okay. They don't need extractions. They all have good dentition before we start long-term use of either of these drugs. That's one way to kind of prevent that from happening. Um, some people, you know, you got to get it to bring your calcium down regardless, but one dose is not yeah. going to be harmful. Mm -hmm. Long term is if you develop osteoporosis of the jaw, it still is kind of nebulous way of fixing things. So usually it can be fixed with some antibiotics, some mouth rinses, et cetera, but it does in some cases require an oral surgeon. And then what's being done there is there's still kind of a little bit of a question. Is it going to be surgery? Or is it more conservative? Those are all things working out. But it's very important to find someone who's adept and has experience dealing with ONJ mm -hmm. from an old surgeon perspective. And so, again, part of the reason getting to a myeloma center is usually we have all these folks in our circle because we use them all the time. Because it is something that can become right. pretty debilitating if we don't fix it and it's sure. directly catch it early. So, mm -hmm. the risk we have to worry about, we're always trying to mitigate, mean, not have this happen. So, you start with that. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I mean, that's a, has a huge impact on quality of life if you if your teeth are bothering you. So and it's hard enough to get poor patients to eat when they are having chemotherapy and, you know, aren't feeling well to begin with. And that only compounds the problem. So it seems like it's really something really important to take into uh, account. Um, OK, so, Christine, if a patient has to miss a treatment because of a side effect, such as uh, they have a low platelet count or some other low blood count, um, what impact can that have on their response to treatment? 
Um, well, we always want patients to stay on uh, schedule with therapy if, if at all possible for the best patient outcome. Uh, certainly, uh, if the patient needs to hold therapy um, for a side effect, such as a low count, um, we will try to continue to support them with growth factors to increase their white blood cells or um, transfusions to increase their red cells if necessary and in hopes that we can continue on therapy. Um, our goal is to keep um, patients on particular therapies as long as they continue to have a response. Um, and that their quality of life is not adversely impacted. Mm -hmm. um, however, if a side effect um, continues, um, a, a dose reduction may be indicated um, or warranted, um, or even a new treatment plan may be indicated. Um, uh, so that's typically, I mean, we certainly want our patients to stay on therapy if they can. Mm -hmm. Right, right. That, that's, that's a goal, right? To keep people mm -hmm. on therapy for as long as possible. Jackie, can you tell us about uh, whether you had any side effects when you were on therapy and, and what the side effects, you know, what they might have been? I was a little nervous, uh, of course, getting started on some of the medications that might cause blood clots or other, you know, similar, not, not, they weren't, they weren't, um, they're just things that they had to disclose, but they weren't very common. Mm -hmm. um, but I worry about everything. So, uh, Again, my medical team was was willing to start me off slow mm -hmm. and progressively see how I, I react to the medication, and, and I did. The only side effect I really had from the steroid was not my best friend, was a little weight gain, um, but came off right after. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it, it, it wasn't bad at all. As long as, you had, as long as you had your uh, cycle going. As long as I had my cycles going, yes. <laughs> So yeah. I mean, having side effects from these medications really just, just, it seems to be so individualized to each patient. Some patients just really have a hard time tolerating medications and some just don't seem to have a hard time. So I guess those are the lucky people. And it's, it's hard to predict, you know, what, what, what camp you're going to fall in before you start taking it. Right. So. Yeah. And I think, you know, the key, for, at least for us, I think is reviewing the kind of common side effects that people have. Like I always tell patients this, and, and I'm sure Jackie can attest, I said, you know, our drugs are really smart, the only there's no side effects. No, I don't, I don't say that part, but I said, they're, they're, they're trying to be smart, they're pretty good, but here are the side effects we need to worry about, so please mm -hmm. let us know, mm -hmm. so we can, you know, dose reduce, adjust, et cetera, so we can make these side effects as manageable as possible, so we can stay on therapy. Mm -hmm. That's, you gotta, you gotta give a little bit of a hint, so you patients know how to help them, or help you help them. Mm -hmm. So those are things I just want to kind of toss out there a little bit. Yeah. If I could also say, I think that's another reason why it's very important you find a myeloma specialist because these medications react to myeloma so specifically versus a, a general physician that may or may not know a whole lot about it. For sure. So um, I think that's another key reason to speak with somebody that is a specialist. Yeah, no, totally agree. Okay, so incredibly, we are now coming up to the top of the hour. So this has been such an amazing conversation. I've totally lost track of time. So it's great. So we're going to um, sort of do our concluding thoughts now. And I'm going to go around and ask the same question of everyone. So the, the final question is, what advice would you give a myeloma patient who just learned about their diagnosis? And Jackie, I'm going to start with you. Okay, I've actually run into a few people who were recently diagnosed, and I have to say, I shouted out on the mountain, I don't know if anyone's heard me, there's hope, there's not just hope, there's promise too that, you know, you, it's not, it's not a death sentence, you know, there's, um, if I was to get any cancer, I had to pick one, this would probably be the one I would pick, um, just because there's so many options out there, um, and you know, it, it's just definitely not the end of the world. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. there's so much work going on in myeloma that everyone so has trouble keeping up with, yeah. with what the newest therapies are and how they work and how well they work and who the, yeah. great, the best patients are to take them. So there is just so much work going on in myeloma. And that's a great, you know, the story of hope is a great story. It really is. It really is. To add to, add to Jackie's um, comments, uh, I always make sure to recommend support groups for patients. It's super important for patients to see other patients that may have been doing this 15 years, 10, 15 years, that really provides much hope for our patients that are just getting started. Mm -hmm. Yeah, agree. Ken, I'm gonna give you the last word. What's your advice? Listen to Jackie and Christine is my advice. <laughs> uh, Great advice. But I mean, it's just gonna, I'm gonna steal 
off of what Jackie already mentioned is that, you know, when I've already said it before, is when you walk in to see me for the first time, no one wants to see me. I mean, my wife says that too, but I mean, from my own perspective, <laughs> uh, but the reality is you don't want cancer. You don't want myeloma. And so I try to make sure they understand that, you know, one in the best time, you know, at this time is the best time in the history to have this disease. It'll be better in five years, but right now we have the best options we've ever had. And so I want to make sure that they walk in the clinic and they walk out of clinic knowing that, yes, we have myeloma. That's the reality. But the expectation is we have lots and lots of hope. We're way up here. Okay. And our job is, again, to get you on the right drugs, the right path, the right doses, and to walk that with you so we can get the best out of we can. We're going to figure out what it is for you as we go. But really, it's a, it's a, it's a hope. It's not, you know, we got to balance that hope and reality. But right now, when you're diagnosed, our expectation is to be a good, a good, effective therapy, very good tolerance to most things. You know, we're all going to have to work on things. Everybody's an individual, as you said. Not everybody responds to the drugs as well as you want. Not everybody tolerates the drugs as well. But again, long story short, it's hope is what we should focus on. The reality is we're going to take care of it for a period of time. Yeah. Uh, and we're going to walk that path with you. And that's the most important part. And it's not just us. It's your family. It's the team of people that are helping with you. You know, this is, it's, it's a, it's a journey. I always kind of say it's a, it's a marathon or a steeplechase, depending on how you want to look at it. Cause it's not always, sometimes there's a little hiccup here and there. Depends you have your horse with you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I would like to say that this gathering of patient, nurse, and doctor is probably the best example of a, an involved and compassionate and really caring care team all together that I've ever spoken to. So I think that every patient out there should look for this type of relationship with their care team and this type of communication and and really regard for each other that that is shown with this group of people right so this is how you you get the best care you get the best outcomes by having this communication making sure that your care team knows what you're feeling what your goals are in therapy, making sure, and if you're the part of the care team, making sure that the patients know what options are available to them and going over the pros and cons. That is so important. And then making a collective decision together as far as what the best path is to take and clearly including the patient and the patient's family in that decision. So that's really, really important. So on behalf of the MMRF, I would like to thank our panelists today, Dr. Shane, uh, Christine Simonelli, Simonelli, sorry, and our, our uh, patient, Jackie Whitaker, for taking the time to join us today. Really amazing, fantastic conversation. I'd like to thank everyone uh, who's on the line here for taking time out of their day to watch our Facebook Live um, and ask that you please uh, complete our brief evaluation survey um, and it's, we put it in the link in the comments section. So we'd really appreciate it if you just take a little bit of time and tell us what you thought about our session. And finally, I'd like to thank our sponsors of this Facebook Live, Adaptive Biotechnologies, Genentech, Janssen, Carrier Farm, and Takeda uh, for sponsoring this session. So thank you so much again, everyone. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.